The first round of the 2002 American Le Mans series takes us to sunny Florida and a 60-car entry for the 12-hour race on a circuit which 50 years ago was just the Hendricks Field Air Force Base. Now it's Sebring. <laughs> A 12-hour race is an intense baptism for any series, but with only one more round between now and Le Mans itself in June, this is a very significant weekend. For the last three years, the winner here has also been the winner in France, which gives you an idea of what it all means. Some teams will skip round two at Sears Point and go straight to France for the big one, but they'll all be back for mid-Ohio. The Miami race, which should have been round two, has been rescheduled for October, and the season closer at Sepang in Malaysia is back on the calendar once again. Defending GT champion Sasha Masson was on pole last year for this race, but the Alex job team got off to a slow start this year and took a while to come to the boil. But with a full head of steam on, the impressive and quick Masson turned qualifying into a drama, snatching the class pole in the last minute of the session. With temperatures in the 30s and rising, the track was slick and the lap times quicker than last year. When Ron Fellows grabbed the GTS pole on track, but lost it in scrutineering. This year, there were no mistakes. This is when we want to win. Uh, qualifying really is, is uh, it's, it's nice, but uh, it's, it's 12 hours that counts, of course. And, and we feel like we're prepared. Um, cars are very close, and uh, yeah, we got a, a, I'm really happy with our driver lineup, uh, certainly my car, and, and uh, yeah, we'll see. Two seconds off the pace, when the dust of qualifying was burned away by the Florida heat, Panos seemed to be already looking at an uphill struggle as they prepared for another season of playing catch-up with the all-conquering Audis. New livery, new aerodynamics and new additions to the driver lineup couldn't boost the Stars and Stripes cars higher than fourth place on the Sebring grid. Ahead of the Panos, not just two factory Audis, but also the lead qualifier in the smaller 675 class, the number 11 MG Lola. An astonishing performance, considering that this is a privateer team that not only beat the 15th placed factory car, but also headed up a further 14 LMP 900s. Well, I, I felt very pleased afterwards, I must say. Um, I, I thought before qualifying, if we got sixth or better, well, really, sixth place I would have been very happy with, so third I was pretty ecstatic, really. But once again, and by that I mean it was a repeat of the order we saw so often all through last season, once again, this was Audi's day at the races, a front row lockout for the works cars, secured by second spot for the number two R8, driven this year by Christian Pescatori, Dindo Capello, and a new face in the shape of champion Audi fugitive Johnny Herbert, all slightly puzzled to be so much off the pace of the other car. So Audi, defending ALMS champions once again, start the first race of the season from pole position with the number one car half a second quicker than its teammate. Clear favourites, though it is a long race, Frank Viola was happy to have already run faster than the track record despite the heat. I don't want to say it's normal that we're on pole, but we really expect it being in the first row and probably beating the other car. And uh, in the end, it was good enough. No, I'm really happy. It's a good start. It's a new season with only a few changes here and there. So in the main, we're looking at the kind of stability of rules and teams, which produces the best racing in any class of motorsport. Buckle up and hold on tight. Blue skies, air temperature in the 80s and climbing, track temperature in the 90s, according to the Michelin engineers. And at almost 10 in the morning, we're ready for the start of America's oldest sports car challenge, 
on what is arguably its most famous racetrack. A reminder of the grid positions for the start of this race, and though a clean start from the front will help for the first few laps, the whole emphasis of this series, with its different classes, is on traffic. And that's even more true in a 12-hour race. A guide to relative performance, yes, but a results booster, not really. Almost everyone got away without problems at the start, except Mimo Chatterella in the Ferrari F50, who started out of the pit lane and is already one lap down on the rest of the field. And they're approaching the final corner of this historic 3.7 mile circuit, waiting for the green flag that will send them on their way. The grid looks good. The weather looks good, conditions are perfect, and for the 2002, the ALMS series is go at Sebring, and into the lead, straight away goes that number one Audi, Tom Christensen, starting the race, probably double stinting it, as most of the drivers will do in this long, long endurance race, and look at this, Capello in second place has got the jump on the champion car, Andy Wallace third, and the MG going down into fourth place. It's Johnny Kane in the number 11 car, the dark car there, was third on the grid, got beaten away from the line by Andy Wallace, tucked in behind him now, and not letting go. Behind that, you can see the Panos, then the Cadillac of Emmanuel Collard, number seven, the number 51 Panos behind that, Wayne Taylor in the number eight Cadillac, all the GTS and GT cars, streaming through 60 cars started this race remember a huge full field and a very busy racetrack as you can see seeming very challenging very twisty in places very very bumpy in places and that's really the difficult thing for most people to get to grips with on board now in the number 23 the alex job borsha of sasha masson leading the GT class away from pole. There's the uh, Ferrari, Memo Chatterer. That car basically was built in the paddock here this weekend. Uh, and the fact that it's made the start at all is extraordinary. But there are other 550 Maranellos here this weekend too. You're riding with Tom Christensen, lead Audi, clear track in front of him. This is the benefit of pole position, but it won't last for very long. Christensen leads, Capello still second, his teammate, then Andy Wallace, then Johnny Kane, then it's Brabham in the Panos, behind that, Collard in the Cadillac, and behind that, again, Panos, again, Cadillac, and then the first, the Riley and Scott, so there's quite a few of those here this weekend, so you'll see plenty of them in the LMP 900 class, what a full field this weekend. How do you tell us that the... R8s, which were the only new car last year, and the Cadillacs are really the only new car this year, that the, uh, the R8s are pretty much the same as last year. That's what they've been saying. They've got some small revisions, but the champion crew, who this year have got a 2001 car, they've got the new fuel injection and all the rest of it, can't understand the two seconds a lap difference between their car and the factory cars. So they're saying, well... The works cars have got something we don't have, but they're not telling us what it is, and the works team are saying, no, we haven't got anything you haven't got. So uh, we'll see how that pans out in the season. But it looks like Audi R8, once again, the car to have, and the current model, once again, is the one to have. There's the lead of the GTS series. The two yellow Corvettes, number three at the front, Rom Fellows, defending champion. And in the crew of that car, you heard him talk about the driver lineup, the crew of that car this year. Again, Oliver Gavin, winner in GTS last year, back again this year. Uh, a three-man car, three man crew in the car for this long 12-hour race. And behind that, teammate number four, Andy Pilgrim, starting the number four car and following fellows around the circuit on board in number three. There's nothing quite like an American V8 when you're going racing. That is a fantastic noise. Absolutely splendid stuff. Hot in the cockpit, unfortunately, of the coupes. The open prototype's probably getting a bit of breeze. The driver's a little bit happier. Very, very hot inside the closed cars. That includes the Porsches, of course, as well as the uh, odd Ferrari or two. And indeed the Vipers. Look behind the Corvettes, you'll just get a flash of Viper. It's Jean-Luc Chirot in number 86, Mike Hazeman, number 46. 
And uh, over for both of them from the FIA GT Championship. They're used to this sort of thing. Coming over to contest the series uh, in America and, of course, in France. And Chirot driving the uh, Le Mans winning chassis from a couple of years ago. And a lot of people think that racing cars can be lucky, can be a good car, like you can get a good Monday car from the showroom or a bad Friday car. Same thing happens to race cars, or so people will tell you. Porsche 23, the car you're looking at now with the red flash on top of the screen. That's Sasha Masson. Very quick in the Porsche, and a pleasure to watch. Always quick, always right up there. Good racer as well. I mean, really, really a hard racer, hard man to beat when he's got the right equipment, and he's definitely got it for this series. Now, remember, that last year's BMW Porsche battle has been defused by the absence of the V8 M3s. Homologation problems, they just didn't build enough, and so no M3s to fight with. Uh, and that really makes this very much a Porsche-Ferrari battle once again, and that's something that we've seen a lot of at Sebring over the last 50 years. Fabio Babini, the man behind in the number 60 car, following the two Alex Job, 23 and 22, there they are, and that's uh, Fabio Babini, number 60 third place in the GT class at the moment and struggling a bit there you can see him he's working a lot harder to stay behind the number 22 car there just a, a little bit scrappier and that's almost certainly down to set up you'll find that the uh, two cars in front of him, the Alex Job cars have got it just a little bit better over the bumps oh and that's one of the Celines in the pits that's number five that's Chris Bingham and a technical problem for him, just a little one. Loose plug leads, they think, early in the race. Early in the race at Sebring, you're looking there at the number 28 Peugeot, which we think might be in a little bit of difficulty. And also at this battle between these two Vipers, who've started a, a place-swapping war. Uh, and there's one going on up front as well because Dindo Capello's taking the overall lead from Tom Christensen, although it's still Audi 1, 2, 3. So the two Corvettes leading the GTS battle and the real battle going on behind them between these two men in the Viper. But as you can see, closing up on the Peugeot now, one of the 675 cars, and we think that there must be a problem because really the GTS Corvettes shouldn't be nibbling away on the rear wing like this. And they are definitely shaping up for a pass, and if they don't pass, they're going to find themselves in a nest of Vipers because the two behind, Chirot and Azerman, really are coming out. And look at this, very early in the race for them to be doing this sort of thing. 12 hours ahead of them, uh, well, a few minutes have gone by, but a long, long race, so there's plenty of time for them to be doing this. And there they go, Hazerman and Shiro. well, oh, just out of shape, now you see he's using up tyres, he's using fuel, he's changing his pit stop windows. If they're planning on double stinting the tyres, they might not be able to if they keep up this sort of thing. They're going at it as if it's a two-hour race. Oh, look at that. Lots of rubber being scrubbed away there. Lots and lots of sideways. It's fun to watch. We're enjoying it, and I bet dare say they're enjoying it as well. Just a glimpse there in the background. I don't know whether you saw it. A red flash. That was another one of the Ferraris we were talking about, the 550 Marinellos, which have appeared this year. And certainly look the part and let's hope they get on the case soon that's the uh, 360 Modena being passed by race leader now back in the lead goes the number one car number two behind remember we heard they'd swapped out of sight earlier on but things obviously have been restored to their former glory for the number one crew Tom Christensen then the man in the number one car closing on traffic we've seen this happen this is where the advantage of pole position really disappears now. They'll be negotiating slower traffic for the remainder of this 12-hour race. It might split the chase up. We've still got there the number 38 champion Audi, followed by the number 11, the privateer, the Nighthawk MG Lola, and sticking with it. Now, 
the theory is that the 675s, the purpose-built 675, lighter but lower capacity, should be able to hold its own against the bigger, the 900 cars. Remember these categories, they're weight brakes. LMP 900, we're talking about kilos minimum. And LMP 675, we're talking about kilos minimum. These boys are racing. Nobody's told them it's a 12-hour race. Either look at this, Johnny Kane having a distinct go at Andy Wallace. Well, Johnny Kane got passed by Andy Wallace early on in this race, right at the start. Now looks like he's sizing up for a pass. The theory is that lighter makes for more nimble in the traffic and round the turns. And the MG certainly proving the point. Everybody said when we see a real purpose-built 675, it will give the 900s a run for their money. And Johnny Kane is certainly doing that, chasing after Andy Wallace through the traffic. And the traffic, of course, is slowing Andy Wallace down, giving Johnny Kane, look, stuck behind one of the Porsches and into the pits now. We're looking at Thomas Erdos with his left rear wheel missing from that Saline. So a bit of contact with another car or a bit of scenery, and that could be the end of his race. And that's the Ferrari we were talking about, Alain Menu, with a gearbox problem. And apparently a pit lane speeding ticket as well. So if he gets that going again, he'll have to come back in for a stop-go penalty. Getting out of the car, shame. Looks good. Like to see it do well, but look at this. There's battles going on throughout the field. Now that's David Brabham in the number 50 panels going past Emmanuel Collard. That's where he is then up to uh, fifth place. And apparently now finding a bit of speed as the fuel load lightens. The front engine panels always has a bit of trouble here at Sebring. The bumps are really quite a challenge for it. The rear engine cars seem to handle it better. And Brabham certainly looking better as the fuel load gets lighter. That's Jean-Denis Delatraz in the pits with an electronic problem of some kind with the uh, Volkswagen powered Reynard. And the body cover's coming off. And here's Brabham catching Wallace. Well, it's certainly running better now. The tyres have really come up to temperature. The fuel load is getting lighter. David Brabham getting into the groove. Can he pass Andy Wallace? Well, at the moment, on this form, he certainly can. This really has to be the Panos target. We have to say that probably the factory Audis are at this stage of the season and by qualifying pace alone a little bit out of reach but he should certainly be able to take the, pay, the fight to the champion team the privateer Audi team and what's that backwards in the tires that is Didier Tays uh, in the uh, Delara Jard he's getting out of the car he's okay that's the final corner and he's backed it right in there's lots and lots of runoff there he's come a long way from the racetrack so that looks like it could be brake failure at this final corner. Look how far he's come in. Well, this is, is this a replay? Yes, it is. This, oh yes, brake failure. Didn't even try to get round, just spun it and backed it to the tyres. Well, that looks like the brakes have not done their job for Didier Taze. We're going to see some pit lane action in a moment then because we'll be looking at full course yellows to recover the remains of that. Didier is very lucky to walk away from that, and that's one of the Freisinger cars on fire in the pit lane. Roman Dumas getting out of that car in a big, big hurry. Fire extinguishers are already there. The safety car's going out because of uh, Didier Taze. Pit lane is closed. Now look behind the safety car. This could be important. That was the number 50 Panos and one of the Cadillacs. It's number seven. It's uh, Emmanuel Collard. Both of them have been in. They've taken on fuel, they're back out on the racetrack, right behind the safety car. Everybody else will come in as soon as pit lane opens. While we're under yellows, they'll get their fuel and their tyres, but those two have just had a very lucky break because they're going to be right at the front when we go back to greens. And it says Tom Christensen, the Audi, P1 still, but he has yet to stop, so he's going to come back in behind everybody else. He's certainly going to come back in behind the panels of David Brabham and behind Emmanuel Collard. There's Didier Taze walking back towards the pit lane. Quite clearly, he's got away with that very lightning. Big, big impact. 
There's Tom Christensen stopping. One of 26 cars coming in on this lap, sparking off a period of confusion over position until the race settles down again and maybe ending the run, which saw the little MG in fourth place at the end of the first hour. Lost a place at the start, which was unfortunate. Just got stuck behind one of the works IDs and the champion car got past me. But uh, I managed just to, I decided to stay in behind Andy Wallace. He's very experienced and this is my first endurance race, really. I let him barge his way through the traffic and I just stuck in behind him, really. Green flag time, and as predicted, the race leader, the number 50 panels of David Brabham, the Audi of Tom Christensen behind, Emmanuel Collard is there. So, good luck in the pits. You can't really say that was good management unless they saw Didier Tay's crash, and that must have been what happened. Think about that. The panels pit crew saw that crash and they called their man in straight away and that is very slick thinking on their part. Very slick indeed. We're riding with Tom Christensen now in the Audi. In second place there's Brabham in front of him and already Christensen sizing him up for the pass. Oh look he's run too deep. Well, he was obviously watching his mirrors, David Brabham. He could see Christensen trying to late break him into that corner. And he outbreaked himself rather than Christensen. Lost the lead and dropped back. He was never going to stay there for very much longer anyway, let's be fair. But uh, David Brabham just trying a little bit too hard there and moved himself back down the order. And the Audis have gone through. We're on board with Larry Schumacher in the number 67. We're, oh, dear. And that was a Viper that slapped him, and I know who that was. Mark Bunting, that's the number 44 Viper. There it is. Well, he's been slipping and sliding all over. The oh, and he's packed it in. Well, it's been all over the shop. He's had several spins, and finally he's out. Oh, and here's why. Look, that's why he's been spinning all over the place. That drive shaft at the back on the left-hand side, obviously broken, and when he gets out of the car, he'll understand that it wasn't a puncture after all. Uh, but a suspension failure that uh, put him out of the race. But I don't suppose the uh, Porsche crew would be too pleased about that one. Here's your race leader then. This is number one. This is Tom Christensen in the Audi. Somewhere out of sight behind him, a minute behind him, in fact now, is Andy Wallace. A long way down. So, already the Wurtz cars stretching out a good size lead over the privateer and looking as faultless and composed as always. And it looks as though this is a good workout for Le Mans 2002. It's hard to imagine that Audi are going to have much trouble with the big race in France on this kind of performance, and it's very early, not only in the season, but in the race to be saying that. Here's the uh, number three Corvette, Ron Fellows, 10th place overall, and of course leading the GTS class. And still behind him is his teammate Andy Pilgrim in the number four car, and he's 11th place and second in GTS. Oh, Masson is on the, well, I was going to say grass, but it's more gravel there. Sasha Masson, who is leading GT, or was until just a second ago, and still is, I think, has just uh, overcooked it, gone very wide indeed. So, commentator's curse, we talked him up earlier on, and now he's thrown it, well, he hasn't thrown it away, he's gathered it back up, a moment perhaps of just stepping wide. There's really only one line here at Sebring, especially at this stage in the race. And so, uh, once you get your wheels on the marbles, you're off and out, as Sasha Masson has just proved. But he's recovered, he's rejoined, no harm, he's done, the car looks good, and that doesn't look good, that's the number 11 of Johnny Kane, was the leader in 675, was fourth before the pit stops, and they've obviously got some serious problems there, and this doesn't look very good for them at all. This is going to hold them up. Well, that's a shame because the uh, privateers were doing well. We do like a David and Goliath story. And really, in this story, Goliath, as far as the Nighthawk team and Johnny Kane are concerned, is the Intersport car. Now, there it is. This is number 37. This is the factory Lola MG. Uh, Michael Durand was second in 675. And with the number 11 car of Johnny Kane, in the pits for however long that may be this car is now the leader in the 675 category
We're under caution at Sebring during this opening round of the ALMS season. It's the second full course yellow of the afternoon, but this one's not due to any individual drama, but just to let the track crews collect the cars that have stopped out on track. There was plenty of them, but there goes the safety car pulling off. There's the green flag, so we're back racing, and we're looking to see normal service resumed for the Audi crew. Now, somewhere in this melee, there he is, the red and silver number one car of Frank Bier. Oh, and he's had the nose chopped off. I think that was 37, but I uh, certainly a 675 car under brakes into the corner. And Frank Biela smoked the tyres there. Just about, I think, got away with that, or did he? Was there a touch there? Certainly it jumped about a bit. Looked as though he touched at the front. Can't see any damage there but that doesn't mean there wasn't any. Might have knocked the steering out of line. There's a clutch of Riley and Scott's for you. We said there was going to be a few here, and in the background there is Brian Herter in the 51 panels. Fourth place, closing on the number 20, Riley and Scott. And at this point, I can tell you that the number 50 panels, David Brabham, had just handed over to Jan Magnussen when the engine went so Brian Herter is now the sole remaining panels in the race. We're on board now in the number two Audi, and there it is, the number two car with the yellow flashes. That's Johnny Herbert, and that is first place. So Johnny Herbert leads this race. So the number two Audi has gone forward, and that means perhaps that Frank Biela, there he is, has got a problem Certainly he slowed down after he had his nose chopped off or he touched the back end, but passing through traffic now, looking as if he's got away with that unscathed, but he certainly lost ground. Well, looks as good as new to me, not a mark on it as far as we can see from here. So uh, that looks as though he may well be able to come back up to the front and rejoin. Johnny Herbert and put Factory Audi first and second once again. And somewhere behind them is, uh, there he is, Jan Lammers in the champion car. A couple of seconds shy of the qualifying pace of the factory cars, as we've said, but running very strongly. Last year's R8, 2001 spec car. And uh, Doing its job, this is why there's a customer Audi team in this field, of course, from Audi's point of view, it's just a little safety net. The blue flag's waving and they're going to be going all afternoon and all evening long because there is so much traffic around this all but four miles. There's Brian Herter in the number 51 car. And I think that is Johnny Kane behind him, the number 11 MG, back out. He's been in the pits for quite some time, but he's back out now and back on the pace so whatever their problem was it seems to have been well and truly fixed because he's now doing to Brian Herter what he was doing earlier on to Andy Wallace in the 38 car he's sizing up for a pass well he didn't quite make it on Andy Wallace but he's definitely looking as though he's got the legs of the panels around here and this is tremendous stuff and of course the traffic aids this and turns it into us a much more even contest, much more evenly balanced, certainly for the little MG, because it's so much handier in the traffic. Remember, it weighs 675 kilos, or is allowed to go down that low. It's probably a little bit over that. But let's call it 700 kilos, and the other one's 900, so it's giving away a fair old piece of weight. It's almost as if Brian Herter in the panels has got two backseat passengers that Johnny Kane hasn't got. And look at this, comes out from under the wing, and this is, he's out dragging the panels on the run down to the corner, and he's definitely going to outbreak him, and slips in front. Well, that was quite something. I don't think we were really expecting that sort of thing, especially not this early in the season, but there you are, on board with Ollie Gavin now in the number three Corvette. Ron Fellows has handed over to Oliver Gavin, still leading GTS, of course. And the Corvette's looking better and better, it has to be said. Really came on strong last year and looking very good again for the start of this season. Hard to see 
from this form that they're going to have much trouble with Ferrari and there is the number 77 car Ricard Rydell who incidentally has just put in the fastest GTS lap of the race so far did I say you weren't gonna have any trouble with these boys the Ferrari the V12 Ferrari proving now to be as quick as we'd all hoped it would be um, he's been in if you saw him in the pits with gearbox trouble when it was Alain Menu driving so he's eighth place in GTS and in 40th place overall on the racetrack but it's certainly quick, fastest GTS lap of the race so far. And uh, no wonder, really, because the engine by IMSA guru, John Ward, who was so responsible for the performance of the Vipers when they were cleaning up. And we've seen several attempts at making race cars out of the Ferraris before, especially in the FIA championship. And, of course, it takes a long time, really, to iron out all the bugs. But it, and they're having them still, but it's certainly looking better and better. So maybe later in the season, we can settle down to a really good scrap between Ferrari, between Corvette, and of course there's Porsches always everywhere in this series, on board in the Audi now. Frank Yehler, no apparent damage then, and uh, the sheer speed and manoeuvrability of these cars is just incredible. And they ride the bumps here at Sebring so well. The chassis is so good. And, of course, the team have got lots of experience with the car. Now they've got a big database to fall back on. They're right on the pace as soon as they got here. And just looking so strong. You watch that on board and it makes you want to quit PlayStation and go racing for real. This is Johnny Herbert in the number two car, race leader at the moment. Tucked right up under the back of the Porsche, looking for his opportunity to get past. I don't think he needed the blue flags. I don't think he knew he was there. And uh, it's so quick by comparison, and just slicing through the field. But of course, lots and lots of work for the drivers. I mean, really got to keep your attention focused. And a 12-hour race like this, not just physically demanding, but also mentally demanding as well. There's the factory Lola, uh, Duncan Dayton, leading 675, and ninth place overall. Not bad going. And somewhere behind him, as we've seen, a long way behind on the timesheets, but somewhere behind on the racetrack, Johnny Kane going like the clappers, as we like to say, on his way back through the field, just put some racing laps on the Nighthawk car. So it's been a good weekend for the little guys this weekend. Certainly nobody expected to see the MG as competitive as it has been so quickly. The Ferrari, well, nice to see that they're on song. We've lost the, uh, the green 550 of Memo Chatterella. And uh, a shame, but that car, as we say, more or less built in the paddock here, so good to see it out at all. Here is the champion car. We've been talking about that as well. The number 38, Jan Lammers at the wheel. And uh, closing up with the Ascaris, we were talking about the little guys. The Ascaris, their first big race here, and this is Christian Colby. And what are we looking at here? Oh, it's going to go. You can see it's going to go. Yes, those are the bumps at Sebring that everybody has to be aware of. Christian Colby loses the back end there. Nothing he could do about that. The Ascaris running very, very well indeed. That's really encouraging for the rest of the season. It's going to be good to see them go well. This is a stop-go penalty for Johnny Herbert for passing under yellows at turn 13. Several people have done that and it might give Frank Viela back the lead. And this is also Brian Herter doing his stop-go into the sin bin, wheels at rest and off you go. Uh, he's another one who did it, passed under yellows and that didn't really stop, did it? That didn't really stop. I wonder what they're going to say about that, the officials who were adjudicating that one. He paused briefly, but that car did not actually stop rolling. So we'll see what happens when the Audis get together on track. Has that little 30-second delay caused by slowing down into the pit lane, down pit road at the speed limit, stop and then back out again and back up to speed. Has that cost the race lead? On board in the Audi, still leads despite the pit stop. And the reason, I think, is that while he was doing that, Frank Biela was slowing out on the racetrack. And here he is in the pits. Well, 
Fuel going in. Frank Viola obviously talking on the radio, shaking his head. That doesn't look too clever at all. What are the Audi crew looking at? They're fueling, that's just routine, and they can't touch the car until it's done. Front coming off. That may mean that he did indeed have some damage when he had a touch earlier on. Remember, it was, I think, the number 37 Lola, uh, but it's certainly one of the 675s, and they're looking at the front, so maybe there was damage after all. There was no scuffs, nothing visible on the body at all. But now they're looking at that left front, and what are they looking at, the brake master cylinder? No, they're looking at the power steering. There's fluid, that's power steering fluid, that's what it is. It's the power steering that has started to leak on that car. There's no way that Frank Biela or anybody else can drive that car for the rest of this race without power steering. Back on board with the other Audi. And as you can see, we're heading into the afternoon now. Some of the temperature going out of this racetrack, which is good news for the drivers because it has been extremely hot here all afternoon. And that's very wearing, as we said, especially for the drivers in closed cockpit cars, some of them coming out from the pit stops and saying that it was too hot to put their foot on the metal pedals in the cockpit. You couldn't rest your feet on the pedals, and that's uh, causing everybody problems uh, as drivers and for some of the cars as well, heat might well be behind the reason for some of the extended pit stops. We're looking at Terry Borshella in the number 26 Celine. This car ran so well last year chasing the class title, which it didn't get. And it ran so well that it's been given 70 kilos weight penalty plus an inlet restrictor and it's still looking good and competitive it's got three green lights showing on the side just in front of the rear wheels if you look you'll find three green lights and the lighting system introduced this year for the benefit of people like us tell us what's going on the lead car in a class gets one light the second car car in its class gets two lights and the third car gets three so that tells you where Terry Borscheller is. Christian Pescatori coming out of pit lane it's evening the lights are on at Sebring so it's Audi number two Christian Pescatori at the wheel a lap to the good over the number 38 champion Audi that's what we were talking about the privateer team there to fill the gap against the rest of the hordes from Panos and similar uh, Andy Wallace doing the driving at the moment. Behind that, the number 51, Panos, and that's Bill Oberlin driving that. Uh, a BMW fugitive from the uh, M Series cars, which are not here this year. So his first baptism in an LMP 900 this weekend. Remember, the number 50, Panos, has gone out with engine failure. Behind that, it's Riley and Scott, and then Riley and Scott. A good weekend for the RNS boys. And a good weekend also for Audi because they are leading, despite Frank Biela's misfortune with the power steering, whatever caused that. So Audi leads and continues to pick its way through the traffic, making it look easy. Making it look very easy. Closing up on the number 37 car. The Ascari is still going well. This is good news for them as well. It bodes well for the rest of the season. Now there is the second Audi, the number one car. Tom Christensen at the wheel. Now with a new steering rack. Fastest man on the track at the moment. Uh, new steering rack. Probably accident damage, we're thinking, after that little touch earlier on. That's 38, that's Stefan Johansson coming out of the pits after a fuel stop. No tyres, though, they're leaving them on. Um, often they are faster when they've been scrubbed. They're faster sometimes in the second stint, in the second hour. And that's a Ferrari being pushed down pit road again. So more problems for them. Let's hope they can get it going and rejoin. We're saying the tyres are often faster in the second hour when they've really been scrubbed clean than in the first hour. And Michelin are celebrating today after leading 5,000 laps in ALMS since the series started. And that's pretty much every lap there's ever been, bar a couple of hundred. So not too bad for them, and it should be quite a party. So back out in... Uh, 
Second place for Stefan Johansson. Four laps up on the Panars. And this is the champion car. Stefan Johansson as afternoon runs into evening in Florida. Audi continue to dominate the first race of this new season and they look to be on their way to a third straight win at Sebring. But then this is motor racing and you know what that means. You're looking at the number 37 MG Lola, the lead car in 675 LMP. Duncan Dayton doing the driving and while Audi continue to lead, despite the problems their number one car has had with power steering, it's Audi first and second because of the number two Audi leads, the number 38 champion Audi, the privateer car has leapt forward to fill the gap, as is its job, as far as Audi are concerned anyway, and the big guys are leading the race, but this has been a weekend of little guys for us. We've seen so many small teams and small cars come to Sebring, to what is arguably the next step down from Le Mans, second only to the 24 hours in terms of harshness on a car, thanks to the nature of the track, and of course only half the length of 12 hours, but that's long enough. We've seen so many small teams and small cars come here and look very, very good indeed. The MG still a bit uncomfortable on the bumps from the outside, it certainly looks it anyway, but that's normal for first timers here. Remember, this is their first race at Sebring, their first ALMS, their first race in America. Um, getting the setup to ride the bumps here isn't easy, and it's kept some very good brains very busy for quite some time. And it's not usually this bumpy, though. Those are track officials, and they're looking at the, that's the safety car. They're looking at the track surface. Well, we've said that the safety car has got a train behind it now. Well, we've said the heat has been a problem here. Temperatures at 90 plus on the tarmac at the start of the race. It's cooled now, but the tarmac has been taking quite a pounding from 60 of these cars, and it appears to be breaking up. The surface of the racetrack is actually peeling. As we've said, it's so hot in the cars that some of the drivers say it's uncomfortable leaving their feet on the pedals in thin racing boots. A lot of the cars have had heat-related problems. The Cadillacs, which came here in Le Mans trim and were more or less on the pace here, have suffered from the heat. What's happened is the heat in the engine has expanded to the point at which the starters don't work. They spent a long time in the pits fiddling about with that. Um, and it's been a bad weekend. Run quick, here they come. It's been a, a, a bad weekend and a good one for Cadillac. I think they've proved the point about speed and they've just got a little bit of organization to do with their airflow through the underbody and they can solve that problem relatively easily. So track repairs are called for here, definitely. But that's not the only problem that Sebring has had during the afternoon. There's been a power outage as well. It's come back in places, but some of the pit boxes are still in the dark. The timing and scoring has also been out, but is back now. So the heat really has taken its toll. But sunset, cool evening air, and we're looking towards the finish of the race fairly soon. Not under yellows, this will all be over soon. I don't think I've ever seen this in a race before. There's some heavyweight road mending machinery out there fixing the racetrack and the race continues under yellows while that happens. But it is full night in Florida and we are back to green and racing in the dark. The safety car is about to come in and when it does, this race will be green. Night racing for the first time for a lot of these drivers. You heard Johnny Kane saying he's never done endurance racing before. They don't do single seat racing in the dark, so it'll be a new experience for a lot of people. There's that green flag then. Hard to see what's happening in the darkness, but the cars with a new light system on them, so you can read the numbers on the side. Have a look when you get close and you see, like aircraft, uh, light up their tail so you can see who owns it. The numbers illuminated for night racing and those two Audis, 38 and 2, together on the track, but they're a lap apart on timing. By working the pit stops during that caution period and now being ahead of the number two car, 
champion have put themselves back on the same lap as the leader. If you remember, the number two early was a lap in front. Well, now it's just a minute and 30 seconds in front. So all the crew of 38 have got to do between now and the finish is stay in front of this car, the number two Audi, which is a fairly tall order, we would have said. We've seen, oh, smoking the tyres under brake. Stefan Johansson has definitely come alive now. He knows it's a tall order and he is trying to do something about it. Stefan Johansson, very experienced racer and really pushing hard. There's the lead car in 675, one green light showing near its number on the side. Tells you're looking at the leader in that class. So this lighting system really working quite well for us. Especially in these conditions because it is very difficult to see exactly what's happening. And imagine racing at 180 miles an hour with only your headlights. Green light on the side tells you that the number three car, still the race leader in GTS, Johnny O'Connell back out onto the... Oh, no, Johnny O'Connell has just handed over to Ron Fellow, so Ron Fellows is going to finish this race for the Corvette team, and he's going to finish it as the leader. Cross your fingers. We said this is motor racing, anything can happen, but it's looking good. That's Brian Herter in the pits. What's that about? Brian Herter in the number 51 panels. They've retired one car and he's got a brake problem. He's been on the radio and said he's been getting a longer and longer pedal. And now they're going to have to do something about that. They may have to bleed the system or perhaps even fit new pads to that car. And with 30 minutes to do before the flag, the team may yet have to retire its one remaining car from the race. We didn't have quite what we needed for the Audis this week, but uh, that's coming, and you know, we had we had everybody else covered. We were looking good to get a podium in my first race with the team. I was so excited, and you know, it's all kind of taken away from us, but we're going to go back out and finish this race in style. And that's exactly what they are going to do, go back out on the racetrack just before the flag and claim a finish and get a result from this weekend. But obviously, racing in the dark without brakes has its drawbacks, so taking it easy. There's the race leader, the number two Audi, Johnny Herbert, who raced with Champion last year, really got to grips with endurance racing. He's been to Le Mans, of course, before and things like that. But there's the flag. That, oh, and there's a spinner, the white flag, saying this is the last lap. And there, that's Jan Lammers in the number 38 car, has backed it into the final corner. And the crew will be on the radio telling Johnny Herbert what to expect so there won't be a problem as he comes round that last corner heading towards the chequered flag at the end of the Sebring race and Lammers will be able to finish as well and take the chequered flag and there it is raised above the number two Audi an upset win perhaps but still a predictable outcome Audi wins, but not the number one car after those problems with the steering. And an excellent second place goes to the champion crew of the 38 car, ahead of a fine third and fourth place for Riley and Scott. Good weekend for the little boys. Ascari in sixth place. MG take the 675 win. It wasn't the number 11 car, which qualified so well. But this was a strong weekend for the championship's first purpose-made lightweight racer. Corvette led GTS from start to finish. And the 23 Porsche led GT the same way. So maybe it was harder work for the crew of the winning Audi than it actually looked. It's the perfect way to start, obviously. But, you know, the crew's done a great, fantastic job. It was great driving with two, uh, two other great drivers as well. So, uh, you know, everybody put it together. You know, and it's always very good when the, the Audi R8 is still the car to beat. So, so that makes it a bit easier, but, you know, you've got to keep those things rolling. And they roll on to round two at Sears Point in California in a little more than a month. After that, it's the biggie of Le Mans, and for the last three years, the winner here at Sebring has also been the winner at Le Mans. So it looks like Audi is already on a roll.